gummy bear. It's the internet, you're busy. Let's do this for April 3rd, 2024. For the next hour or so, let me help you sort through the world of gaming on Game Mess Mornings Live with me, Jeff Grubb. Today, we may get another Prince of Persia game very soon, and the summer Game Mess season is upon us. But first, please join me in welcoming today's co-host of Game Mess Mornings. It's Steven Spawn, everybody. Steve, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing really good. Wait, I'm supposed to make noises. Woo! Yeah! Oh, woo! Yes! <laughs> oh that's perfect. Let me think. Oh, I gotta, yeah. Yes, that's fantastic. <laughs> uh, yeah, those, so, yeah, Steve, uh, it's, it's been a minute yeah. since we talked. Uh, how, how have you been? What games have you been playing recently? How's it going? I'm doing really well. Uh, you know, it's 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 a feast or famine kind of time right now for gaming. It's a little like bit. There's like, yeah, like 95 games, and then you're like, when's there more games coming out? So I feel like I'm in the middle of that backlog. I cannot get through all the games I want to play. Um, mostly because I, I can't escape Tarkov. I've been trying to escape it for a long time. It keeps it keeps pulling me back. I don't know. I uh, uh, well, that's I mean, Tarkov, I've never even been able to get into an extraction shooter. Is Tarkov still the one I should go to if I have yeah. some curiosity about that genre? Absolutely. Yeah, it's 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 the the one that sort of is becoming the dominant one over it. it and the, the amount of people that watch Tarkov now, too, is just ridiculous. Holy crap. There's uh, tens of thousands of people in that category any day of the week. Yes, it's uh, it definitely seems like that. that is the um, maybe not the shooter genre du jour, but it, it seems like the one that is uh, the newest and freshest for a lot of people after uh, Battle Royales kind of took over from traditional just uh, the Counter-Strike kind of games. Um, mm -hmm. I, so, okay, so it's not worth it for me to like go into uh, the Call of Duty one or something like that, or, like a simpler one. I should just cut my teeth on Tarkov. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't have the same, the, the, the one thing that, that a lot of them are missing that Tarkov has is that fear. It's almost like, it's Ooh. almost like having a you know, horror game that you're playing with a shooter. It's, Ooh. it's, it's adrenaline constant, you know? Uh, that is, uh, that is so my jam too. Cause that's what, that is what oh, I yeah. liked about PUBG over a lot of the other ones is I felt actually scared in PUBG and I oh, never yeah. feel, never feel scared in Fortnite. Not that that's really a knock against Fortnite. Fortnite's doing its own thing. But yeah. for me, I did come for that adrenaline. That's it's the adrenaline rush constantly. It, and you know what the weird thing is, you you a good player only lives sixty percent of the time in Tarkov. So when when you actually have some kind of loot in your bag and you manage to get out with it, it is a ridiculously good high. So <sighs> yeah. All right. Yep. Uh, it's yeah. gonna I'm gonna have to make it happen. It's time. Uh now, now especially oh, yeah. now that things are starting to slow down a little bit with, with game releases, I feel like I can make mm -hmm. time for some of these things I imagined I would always go back and play. Man, the great thing about Tarkov is it wipes every six months, and this one's like the best one that they've ever done. So it's it's phenomenal. They're they're figuring out their player retention problem, which is great. That's uh, that's fantastic here. That's getting better than ever. Um, Steve, uh, one one of the reasons I, I had you on here is Lucy's just too lazy. She went to some concert last night, and she's like, <laughs> she mentioned Steve's got something going on this weekend. Maybe that'd be fun to have him on to talk about it. You're having you're having a charity gala this weekend. Tell, yeah. tell the people about that. What's that like? How did that get started? I know this is the second annual one. Uh, how is it getting bigger this year? How can people participate? Yeah, I appreciate you having me on to, to talk about that. It's uh, of sort of my my labor of love on uh, gaming and disability, right? So we discovered during the pandemic that it's it, it kind of sucks when you can't go out to conventions, when you can't get to these places. And we came up with an idea is what if you could have all the fun of a convention but it was online and only online and so we put together this little uh, app uh, on gather town um, that allows you to go in and be a, a 2d character like a stardew valley where you're literally walking around this virtual environment entirely dedicated to uh, all the things that able gamers does uh, helping people with disabilities be able to play games um it, it's phenomenal last year uh you know we had uh, ninja brian from nsp on there you know doing the headlining having uh, djs all night long and it's just it's just a giant party it was just a giant uh, celebration of gaming and how we can all play together. It was, it's phenomenal, and uh, I've been super proud to be a part of it for uh, the last two years. This is year number two, which means that we can only do better than last year, I think. Um, so, you know, let's just keep making it better every year and, and inviting people to come have a good time. We um, have a bunch of influencers, a bunch of friends, um, 
you know, inviting people like you to come along and be like, hey, I'm going to be there. And then your fans get to go, oh, wow, I actually might get to meet the Jeff himself. Holy crap. <laughs> yes, I and uh, I'll, I'll definitely be there. That sounds uh, it sounds like a great time. It is. Um, it, it's it's all online. How do you make sure the environment feels like uh, spontaneous and anything can happen and you can meet anybody? You know, that's that's the beauty of uh, the online world is it's it's it really is a starter map in a lot of ways. It's, uh, you know, people over here to talk to. You can walk through people. You're able to take part in events. Last year, um, World of Warships put a freaking ship in the middle of the map because why not? <laughs> You know, um, it was great. They were like, can we put a submarine in the water fountain? I'm like, I don't think we can do that, but okay, maybe something. So, so ended up having a giant thing there. It's great. But um, yeah, people from Logitech, Voodoo, Ranger, Twitch, uh, we're having a, a lot of high-level interest this year in, in Celebration. It's actually Able Gamer's 20th year. I, I, mean, it's, I, oh, wow. I think I, yeah, I don't, I don't remember if it was like year two or three that I met you, but we're old, my friend. It's mm-hmm. uh yeah, we've been doing this a while. So a long, long time, yes. Uh, yeah. Twenty years, holy moly. Um, yeah. Okay, so let's. Uh, people are are hearing this; they're interested. How can they participate? Where should they go? Uh, what does it take to get into the gala? Go to ablegamers.org/gala, and you'll see this really cool page that tells you all about the uh, entertainment and what we're doing. Talks about Nolan Pierce, but don't tell her I said that. Um, <laughs> and. <laughs> it's, it shows off, uh, you know, who's all going to be there, and you can buy either a ticket for twenty five bucks, or um, there is a loot box that we've got for uh, more support if you have a couple extra dollars and you want some memorabilia. It's a really cool box that has new and different stuff every year. This year, our friends over at Logitech uh, coming in with some uh, virtual goods that are only there for the first hundred boxes. So uh, once they're out, they're out, and then with just a water bottle with able gamers that you're paying for it. So I suggest you go get your lunch sticks though. And and uh the and the money that like funds the gala, does that go into uh, like uh, funding able gamers core mission? Is this like just all kind of pays itself forward? Yeah, this is all just an event just to celebrate Able Gamers and raise money for it at the same time. Unfortunately, um, Able Gamers is no different than any other charity. Financially, it's been a hard year in the industry, the video game industry. We all know this has been a hard year. So, you know, donations across the board for all charities are down. It's no different with Able Gamers. And rather than doing a PBS style, please give kind of thing, we just want to go celebrate, have a good time. The gaming community has always done great taking care of us and making sure that the funding that we need is there to help gamers who need the equipment that we provide yeah uh there is uh I, a lot of uh, i think reasons why i enjoy going to events but i do often think about like how hard it was for me to even be able to afford going to events early on in my career or even before yeah. i had a career and um i think this idea of like, let's cut out all of that superfluous stuff the stuff that does get in the way and and try to virtualize it in the best way possible I, I'm, it's admirable i'm glad you're doing this i'm uh, i'm happy to participate in it I, I can't wait so uh thanks for coming on and talking about it steve again w- w- one more time where should people go if they want to participate yeah go to ablegamers.org slash gala find out how to buy a ticket and you can see pictures and video from last year's event to see how cool it is if you combine zoom plus stardew valley Hell yeah. All right. Uh, let's explain what we do here on this show. Most weekdays, I, Jeff Grubb, will help piece your gaming life back together. That includes breaking news and maybe even some of our own original reporting. For all these topics, I'll get the input of a bona fide expert who will make me look smart. If you are watching live on Twitch, welcome. You can always listen to the show later on podcast feeds by searching for Game Mess Mornings or find the RSS on GiantBomb.com. You can also catch the show later with chapters and timestamps on YouTube. Hello, YouTube. All right, we have a lot to get into, so let's start the morning mess with 60% of playtime in 2023 went to six-year-old or older games, new data shows. This is from Zach Swizen at Kotaku. A new, newly released game industry report by market researcher Nuzu shows that while the PC and console market grew by 2.6% in 2023, overall playtime de- decreased as gamers spent more and more time in a smaller list of old games like Fortnite and League of Legends. On April 2nd, Nuzu released its second annual game industry report, including a ton of data and information on what people were playing and spending money on during 2023. According to Nuzu's data, the PC and console game market grew and reached $93.5 billion in revenue in 2023. 
that might seem like good news, but drilling down into the data, it becomes clear that it's only good news for a small number of publishers and developers. News, Newzoo's data shows that the top 10 games on each platform, ranked by their average number of, of monthly active users, or MAUs, are filled with old established titles. Fortnite took the crown on all platforms, including Switch and PC. The rest of the list include titles that won't surprise you, like Grand Theft Auto V, Counter-Strike 2, Roblox, Minecraft, Rocket League, Apex Legends, Fall Guys, Valorant, and Call of Duty. Across Xbox and PlayStation consoles, only one dedicated single-player game cracked the top 10, and that was Starfield. Um, Steve, I've talked about this news report in a couple places now. I know that it was, uh, it, they had a thing at um, GDC, I think, where they talked about this. Uh, people started picking it up uh, yesterday. I figured it's, it's a good time now, like, not to let the conversation get by. I am a little bit worried about what I see in these numbers, Steve, where... Um, it feels like the sportification has has come to gaming where people treat it as a hobby and that is sort of hard to ignore so in sports you know we have, we, we have established sports that people choose as their hobby and it's very hard to introduce a new sport and draw people away from those it does happen people point out pickleball i yeah sure that's out there and people are are, are getting interested in that for the first time in some time but for the most part people you know, like your kids go play, goes to play soccer. They go to play something else like that. They they aren't like taking chances on something new and strange and different. And now that gaming is this service based thing, and and so many people are like getting on these things to spend time with their friends, it feels very much like the same thing is happening here. Is that a problem? Is 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 that something where it's like you know that that is this a natural endpoint for where gaming was headed? How do you feel about it, Steve? You know. Number one, uh, being a disabled AF person, I don't understand pickleball. How am I supposed to hit the pickle when you throw it at me? It doesn't make sense. <laughs> Steve, I no don't... one understands pickleball. Listen, okay, we're, all, we're all in that same boat. Okay. All right. Just wondered. It seems like you need a lot of hand-eye coordination there. I don't know. Um, yeah, I just eat the pickle. I don't get it. <laughs> you know, there is a thing here in Pittsburgh called Picklesburg. You could come. You could eat all the pickles you want for an entire weekend. So That sounds less. delightful. <laughs> uh not the cotton candy part that's weird anyway um so um no i i think this is kind of just where gaming is going i mean the, the past the list um when i was looking at the graphic this morning it's like you know fortnite rocket league the sims it, it league of legends it, you're literally naming off all the games that all of my streamer friends are constantly playing and it's right. hard to break out of it not not only because you know like you're saying if people wanting to play it but that's what they want to watch too it, like if you are someone who's a streamer and you're trying to go outside of these top 10 it is a hard road it is a steep climb like people just want to watch what they want to watch even the top of the show talking about my game tarkov is more than six years old so yep. you know it's 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 something strange and i, I kind of wonder in my head sometimes are we kind of at the point of the video game industry as where movies start remaking themselves because they're running out of really great original ideas so they start rebooting but you it's really hard to do that in the video game land you know yeah i, I mean i think that um you know we definitely are at a place where like a lot of the big companies are remaking a lot of their biggest games i mean and and but the, at least they're doing it in the kind of ways that are big and interestingly some of them capcom um and then i think that funds their ability to take chances on some other stuff and we get dragon's dogma 2 uh which does feel pretty original even though it's very similar to dragon's dogma 1 in a lot of ways uh but but it, it just it feels like this is it, it's inevitable at a certain point that if you try to get a, you know as many people playing a handful of games as possible because that's just economically that makes the most sense you want to have one big live service game that just can draw in everybody that it takes up all the oxygen out of the room and it makes it impossible to sort of escape its gravity. I think Matt Piscatella from uh, what was once MPD, now Circana, refers to them as black hole games. It's just because their gravity is so great that nothing escapes them. And uh, th the thing about a black hole is it just gets bi it gets bigger and it sucks in more and it's it, it, like it becomes more difficult to escape its gravity over time. It doesn't sort of wane in power. So... Um, and it like looking at the numbers that continues to be the direction that things are going now i is this really a concern is does this mean we get fewer interesting games i'm not so sure about that i think what these numbers say to the big companies is is your risks are riskier than ever so yeah maybe fewer interesting games from the biggest companies but i think there's going to continue to be a bubbling up of indie games that really fill in a lot of those gaps so i'm not like 
oh, like walking around uh, like Charlie Brown worried about the, oh, this is the end of video <laughs> games. But I, I, I do think like, hey, we are going to be in for some lean years from the big companies that were accustomed to really seeing the most interesting games or at least the biggest, most interesting games. I, yep. Does that sound right to you? And, you know, I think one of the things that we're looking at this a little bit off on is less than black holes. It almost feels like it's more like bubbles is how we're used to seeing video games, right? It's like, take yeah. for example, you mentioned PUBG earlier, right? Nobody thought PUBG could be taken down until one day nobody played it. And that's kind of the way the video games seem to work is you got like this huge, huge bubble of the amount of people that want to play it. And then all of a sudden something else comes along, pops it, and then you have just the core audience in there. And then everyone else sort of goes on to the next thing. And we're kind of used to that, but yep. it hasn't happened to Fortnite. It hasn't happened to Minecraft. It hasn't happened to The Sims, uh, you know. But then again, they're really good at, at bringing down their own games. For example, Sims 5 will replace Sims 4. So, you know, but Fortnite. I mean, I don't know, man. It's such a mega beast. I don't know that you kill it. Yeah, and I think you're right. This is, I think we were just used to things working that way for so long that a change in that, I think what I consider to be the natural order of video games, the, the one thing that's true about video games is it's never stable. Something's always going to replace it. And it's like, you know, that was true for the first 30, 40 almost 50 years of video games but in the grand scheme of things that's not that long especially like you look at the way like you know movies have has changed and sort of settle into the way it works it's like that took a long time and it's it's much longer and it's even that's not that old of a of a medium um but it's yeah. like maybe this is the new natural order like and uh and as long for me as long as there is a space like like steam for small teams or even relatively big teams to take chances on in, from the indie space and have their own ideas and kind of do a punk rock like we're just going to do our own thing yeah. and have the chance to burst through with something that no one was expecting i think one i'll be happy because that there's plenty of games to keep me interested with that stuff while i also occasionally dive into something like a tarkov where i'm like i'm glad that these things have massive scenes and and feel like a hobby and i can hop in with people who are, are, are right there to either guide me or to give me a hard time, whether either one, that's gonna be fun. Um, so it's like, I'm glad that space exists, but at the same time, I, I need like interesting ideas. For me, novelty is like one of the big things that has always kept gaming interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't I don't think that will necessarily go away. I think they're gonna keep pumping out those games. So I'm feeling pretty good. And I, I think the other side of that is the, the indie game scene is still kind of where a lot of these interesting ideas that have taken over the space did come from. I mean, uh, Minecraft was certainly that. Uh, Roblox, kind of that. Uh, even like PUBG establishing a, a, a P battle royale was that. I think Tarkov's not from some like a, you know a major publisher. So yeah, I, I I think that if the indie game scene can keep producing interesting ideas, one of those actually could maybe br break the grip that even something like Fortnite has. Although that's looking less and less likely all the time. Yeah. I don't know if the uh, FEN is going to work the way that they want it to. Like you know, the, the Fortnite engine is amazing. But uh, do we think that we'll ever see another League of Legends, which, for those of you who don't know, League of Legends spawned because of Dota, which spawned out of, World War, uh, out of Warcraft 3. So the whole World of Warcraft IP is really what started League of Legends in a very weird way. Yep. So I don't know if we're ever going to see a daisy chain like that again, you know? Yeah, I, I think that um, I think you're right. I think that that sort of what was once the Daisy Chain out of the modding scene from big established games has sort of migrated to eh, let's just make our own game and put it on Steam early access. So I, I think that the spirit of that is probably still happening. It's just not working the, that same way. And I think you're right that um, Fortnite, Unreal in Fortnite, uh, is not going to be the thing that creates that. Actually, it, you know, they're trying to be Roblox. I think the people that come to Fortnite have a certain expectation of the games that they play having a certain level of, of, of sheen and quality to it and um, kind of the uh, lo-fi gaming experience of Roblox that would not be a good match <laughs> for what happens inside Fortnite. But I don't know. We'll see. I, I, I've been wrong many times before, Steve. We'll see if it happens again. What? <laughs> I know, right? It's it's shocking. I'm not trying. I'm not here to, <laughs> to frighten you. <laughs> Um, all right, let's move ahead here. Sony is planning a PlayStation showcase next month, it's claimed. Um, this is from Tom Ivan at VGC. Sony is reportedly planning to hold a PlayStation product showcase next month. That's according to giant bomb buffoon Jeff Grubb, who said today he's heard a bunch of times that either a PlayStation showcase or a state of play will take place in May, uh, following the news that Konami's Silent Hill 2 remake, remake has been classified by, by the ESRB. Um, 
So yeah, on the Bombcast yesterday, I mentioned that uh, I've, been, I've been hearing multiple times now there will be a PlayStation something next month. Um, it's It does sound like it's leaning towards a showcase. They definitely did a showcase last May, so it's not too shocking, although looking to patterns is never a, a, a sure thing. Um, and yeah, I think something like a Silent Hill 2 could show up there, although it could happen earlier. I, I, this is That's kind of unrelated. That's me guessing about Silent Hill 2. But yeah, uh, I think PlayStation doing a showcase in May is something of a relief. Uh, I am, I know that they said in a financial report, Steve, that they don't have any major like franchise follow up sequels for, for, for coming from any of their first party studi studios this year, and that that's their fiscal year, so through March of 2025, and that can feel kind of barren. But that doesn't mean that they don't have a lot of games that are either you know from these newer studios or partner games you know, from Square Enix or whoever else, they probably do have a, a number of games to talk about and I am, I'm ready to hear about it. I think PlayStation's been kind of quiet for some time and coming out and saying, here's what's happening for the rest of this year, even if it isn't from our first party, will be a relief. And I also, I, keep, I do keep hearing that there will be some smaller first party games like that Astro game that is supposedly still happening this year. And I am very excited about that. So yeah, does the PlayStation Showcase sound right to you? Are you excited? Are you ready for some games to get announced for your PlayStation 5? You know, I think the wild thing about PlayStation is it it almost feels like either you're a PlayStation fan or else uh, everything else, your attention goes to Xbox Game Pass. And that's that's sort of it. Like, is it all Game Pass? Great, I'm going to play it. Um, you know, the, the Sony entire ticket has been a little lackluster the last couple of years. It's got a couple of big hits, but then, I don't know, it's it's almost like they're worrying more now about quantity right now than quality. It seems like they, they have these a lot of games that they put out there, and you don't see a lot of mass market advertisement for them. Um, it's I don't know, it kind of boggles my mind a little bit where they've almost kind of fallen into they want the journalists to get their message out there that the games exist rather than you don't see as many PlayStation ads as you used to on television or Twitch, you know, anymore, but you see a lot for Xbox games. So maybe that means they're going to start pushing them again. Yeah. And I definitely, I think I remember, um, I think it was Sony. It might've been take two. I might be conflating these, but one of these, uh, the CEOs of, uh, at the time were saying, you know, the, one of our, our biggest costs isn't even labor. It's marketing. We spend so much on yeah. marketing yeah. that we want to cut back on that to save a lot of money. And, you know, th at this point, maybe the PlayStation 5 kind of sells itself in, in a lot of ways. Um, uh, you know, I say that. And then, of course, we do know that the PlayStation 5 did not meet its very high expectations for the last fiscal year. But those were always super inflated. It was never really going to reach those numbers when you look back at it. Um so yeah, play, so it seems like PlayStation just like can ride some strength here and not have to spend a ton on marketing. But they also, it, I think, the reality is they just haven't had a lot of games to market. Uh, you know, mm. the Spider Man. They definitely had there were a lot of ads for Spider Man. Yeah, yeah. And then we came off of that, and it's like, well, and then what's next? And it's like, well, they they, they said flat out, eh, not much. I think once they have some new IPs to talk about, I think you start with the PlayStation Showcase, Steve, and then that ramps up to a mm -hmm. a summer uh, advertising campaign to lead you into the holidays. Does that sound right? That sounds about right to me. I mean, you know, we they just did the um, Sony Access controller, which um, I got to take part in that marketing, and right. it was it was really cool um, to work with the team. And that, but that was like the big most major push I've seen them do in a while. I think about about games like Rocket League and whatnot that I would have never found out about if it wasn't for a friend playing it because they weren't really heavily advertised. And sometimes I kind of wonder if. A lot of us are trapped. Okay, so the, the lead story was about how we all play the top 10 games, right? Yep. But is that because we only want to play the top 10? Or is that because it's so hard to hear above the noise of all the games that are released, a game that you might truly love, you just might not know it exists? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's both. I think that's a big part of it. I mean, look at um that content warning game that came out this week that was uh their, their marketing strategy was... Uh, we are going to be free for the first 24 hours, and then it's—I think it's like eight dollars after that, or something around there, maybe maybe ten dollars. Um, but for that first 24 hours, it was free, and then I think it, they probably partnered with a lot of, um, of content creators, and the game was downloaded something like six million times on that first day. Because actually, what works is word of mouth, right? That's mm -hmm. and but word of mouth is a very difficult thing to get people the word of mouth is friends spending their social currency with one another 
and you don't do that for something that you're not sure of, especially if you're going to ask a friend mm -hmm. to spend money on something. So, so making your thing free is, is, is one good move on that because people will be like, hey, get this while it's still free. It's limited time. That's what I did in our Slack at work. I'm like, Everyone just get this because we're probably going to play it someday. I don't want to have to like track down codes for you. I still got I still got codes because I knew these bastards wouldn't download it. And of course, <laughs> some of them didn't. So I got a handful of codes for them. I, I still, I'll hand those out to you, Jan. Jan, um, but but it's like I, you can't just r repeatedly say, "Hey, buddy, get this other seventy dollars game to play with me," and maybe maybe you'll like it, maybe you won't. You can only do that so many times. So the free to play games, the sure things, the things that uh, have been proven successes, are the things that continue to grow in word of mouth as well. I think, Steve, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, word of mouth is how you sell a game. I, I mean, um, when we did the. Um... Uh, GDC awards uh, thing two years ago, uh, and I got up on stage. I literally called out uh, inscription as the night of the you know, <laughs> what we were doing that night because it had won like 95 awards, and uh, it had only been running for like I don't know. This the show had been on for five minutes. They already won that many awards. I didn't even know how it was possible, but <laughs> they, they, kept, they kept winning the whole time. And and I think that's kind of where we end up with indie games is you yeah. get this like really standout one that comes above the rest, and this that's all anybody talks about. And again. I think Runaway Success like that is great. Inscription is a fantastic game. If you've never tried it, you should. Um, but at the same time, uh, there's there's only so much air. I know um, a lot of my friends in the, the author world talk about it all the time. And I kind of wonder if it's now in gaming, too, where there are so many random crappy books that come out that someone put no effort into. They went to chat GBT and said, write a book. And it was like, okay. And then wrote a book and then you publish it. Right. And so if you, you have to scan through all those in order to find the ones where somebody poured their heart and soul for eight years, yep. it might be really easy to miss it accidentally. Yep. Absolutely. It's uh, and I think that comes back to like, so when people recommend something, uh, they do it with they do it with some hesitation, mm -hmm. and you want to be very careful about it. And that so that that's a big hurdle to overcome in a lot of ways. So, yeah. you know, come back to PlayStation Showcase. This is um, I think PlayStation could talk to their audience. I I think that that audience is always ready for PlayStation to say, here are the games that matter. Um, Sony doesn't, but they, it doesn't feel like Sony always capitalizes on that. Uh, to be honest, so. We'll see. Hey, a showcase usually means some big stuff. Um, they also have that rumored PS5 Pro coming out later this year. Maybe, you know, that caps off the end of a, of a showcase. So there'll, there'll be stuff to talk about. Uh, I just, um, you know, I hope there's some fun games. That's, that's all I'm looking so, for. Yeah. Uh, all right, you know what? Actually, let's, uh, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, when we get back, plenty more headlines to get to. Let's uh, go ahead and hit that right now. See you soon, everybody. All right, we are back, and this was an interesting one. Prince of Persia. There's a new Prince of Persia game from Dead Cell devs coming, and that's according to a report. Uh, this story comes from George Yang at GameSpot. A new Prince of Persia game is reportedly being developed by Evil Empire, the studio behind Dead Cells. The game is reportedly called The Rogue Prince of Persia and will be released in Steam Early Access. According to a report from Insider Gaming, it's apparently a new roguelike game and it's been in development for the last four years. The art style is also reportedly inspired by Franco-Belgian comics, which sounds incredible to me. Uh, while it's reportedly slated to be released later this year, it's unclear when it will be officially announced. However, it could be revealed at the Triple I Initiative Showcase on April 10th as Evil Empire will present its new project there. Um, Steve, we just got a Prince of Persia game, and yet this do this doesn't bother me at all. I love the idea of a um, a franchise I like getting, you know, bang, 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 multiple entries from different developers taking different ideas and different approaches to it. And a roguelite Prince of Persia game sounds, especially from people who made Dead Cells, a game I really love, sounds very promising to me. Um, how do you feel about this approach of like, hey, we just we had our team make a Prince of Persia game, and we have this indie studio making a Prince of Persia game. Is that something that makes sense to you? I mean, we just talked about it, right? Why not let the indies have a crack at something, and especially uh -huh. a roguelite? Man, roguelites and roguelikes are just one of my favorite genres Same. nowadays. It, they, they just add something so new and fresh, especially if it has like a meta progression in it. Oh, man, yeah. Uh, F me up on that. It, it, <laughs> those, those, those are my kind of jams. Uh, anything where you can fail at a game, quote unquote, while also succeeding. Yeah, those are fun. Imagine that in the Prince of Persia world. That could, that, I mean, it kind of, the, the roguelike theme just kind of fits naturally, you know? Right. I mean, it, again, a, a franchise that's had time travel a bunch of times, rewinding. 
yeah, you could yeah. easily see how that would fit uh, with, like, lore-wise, but also, yeah, just a good fit for uh, taking something that maybe looks a little bit like Dead Cells, applying that Prince of Persia skin, uh, and then bringing in some stuff that is very Prince of Persia. Yeah, I, I, and I totally agree. Like, the idea of when you fail in a roguelite, but you feel like, okay, I learned something, so that's one piece of progression, and maybe there's a little bit of meta progression that I'm unlocking stuff that will be now showing up in the game later. Those two things sort of trick my mind into, into like feeding into one another. It's like, oh, I'm progressing because I'm unlocking stuff, and really I'm progressing because I'm learning the game more, uh, but those things like just fit together really well and keep me attached to the game in a really strong way. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I am very attracted to this, to this idea. I'm also with you on the let's let the indies have a crack at it. Um, I, uh, I go back to this reference point a lot, but my favorite, I'm a Star Wars fan. My favorite era of Star Wars video games was when they were putting out like 50 a, a, a year and they'll be like, oh, here's 10 over on this console and here's a bunch okay. on PC and here's some that you can only get on N64. And uh, that stuff is like, oh, just a bunch of different developers taking different ideas and running with it. And that still does kind of happen today with other franchises like Warhammer. Warhammer is a bunch of studios making stuff for them. And I'm like, yeah. why is that approach not more common? And I hope this is the sign that maybe that is happening. It probably isn't. Yeah. This is probably just a quick little offshoot, but I, I wish it was more common. I think you bring up the quaint essential uh, example of uh, putting out massive things is not a bad thing. I mean, a Warhammer puts out a new a show, a figure, a book, a comic, and a billboard every three minutes. Yep. So, exactly. um, you know, it's, and, and people eat it up, man. It's it's one of the most uh, you know uh, fervent fandoms out there. I think uh, if if you're a Warhammer fan, you love Warhammer. Mm -hmm. So you know you'll buy everything they've got, and it it is strange. You're right. There, there aren't a lot of other IPs that really dive into that even marvel has pulled back saying yeah. okay we're, we're fatigued now so you know they're they're, they're what, down to three shows a year now it's because they're afraid that they're tapping the market right so, now they only have one movie this year yeah and and it's yeah. and I, I mean i and i obviously there, there's some sensitivity to uh making something that felt special no longer feel special but i i mean I don't know if I was getting an X-Men 97 beat em up arcade beat em up this year oh, yeah. from like yeah. an indie studio I, I, there's no way I'd be complaining. That's exactly no. what I want. And then maybe something else I wasn't expecting from a studio that's like taking the idea and twisting on it. Like, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think obviously the problem here seems to me that there aren't just endless studios out there pitching ideas to these big publishers and it's hard to like make these matches. Um, but I don't know, figure it out, figure it out, John Drake. I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, Saber Interactive CEO says it's Star Wars KOTOR remake is still alive and well. Yet again, uh, this is from Chris Scullion at VGC. The CEO of Saber Interactive has confirmed that its remake of Star Wars Knights of, uh, Knights of the Old Republic is still in active development. In an interview with IGN, Matthew Karch was asked to definitively confirm that Saber was still working on the game following its split from Embracer Group last month. Uh, he said, it's clear and it's obvious that we're working on this. It's been in the press numerous times. What I will say is the game is alive and well, and we're dedicated to making sure we exceed consumer expectations. Now, uh, this is something that uh, uh, is partially happy. To par par this is partially my fault. I had that story where I'm like, ah, that game sounds dead. Um, and then I corrected it the next day saying, I it sounds dead as far as Sony's concerned. Uh, I don't know if the studio's still working on it. And then, of course, uh, Jason Trier had that story. He's like, no, nah, they're still working at the studio. I don't know if it'll ever come out, but they're still working on it. Um, and now every time that anyone from, uh, from Saber talks about uh, anything, they have to answer that question, is that game still alive? So my bad, Saber. Uh, but... <laughs> I wish someone would ask the, would have asked them, hey, it, it, what about Sony's involvement? Because this game originally got announced at a Sony showcase and as a big Sony uh, like a PlayStation partnership uh, where it was like PlayStation is publishing this game. And again, as far as I've heard is now Sony wants nothing to do with it and they've they've kind of severed that. I, I, I'm a little confused about how that would work because it's like I would assume there's a contract there, uh, but maybe the game was, uh, maybe they had like an out clause at some point and they got out of it. But as far as I'm aware, Sony wants nothing to do with this game anymore. Uh, so what what about that side of things? We I, That still, still seems up in the air. Uh, but for your part, Steve, uh, KOTOR remake, they're still working on it. They want to exceed consumer expectations. Probably not coming out for several more years. Are you excited? Is this something that you care about? 
I liked the Knights of the Old Republic, and I was a huge um, Star Wars Old Republic MMO fan. I uh, played that for years, so I love that world. I love that universe. Uh, but it's 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 interesting to me to see when a publisher kind of loses steam on something, how that can really affect you know what happens to it. We just talked about marketing, you know, it's a big thing. But yeah, I don't know whether or not they'll they'll ever get done with it. But thing is, it's Kotor used to be that thing you just talked about, where they just released another one every time they felt like it. Like, you know, mm -hmm. there's a billion you know, Knights of the Old Republic, uh, and we all liked all of them. So, you know, maybe get back into just letting people grab a saber and go light some stuff up, you know? Yep. That sounds real nice to me. Um, I, uh, I I like Saber Interactive. Uh, I, I continue to think that they do good work. Uh, they are very busy. They got Space Marine 2. They're supporting Expeditions of Mudrunner game. Uh, they have several other projects. Um, I believe that they can make a good Knights of the Old, uh, Old Republic uh, remake if they have the time and the budget. Uh, that is the big concern, though. It seems like it would re require a lot of money to make the game as it was announced. Um, we'll see, though. Uh, if any studio can like make it work, it is. The, there's some technical wizards over there at Saber, so I'm, I'm hopeful. Uh, new research suggests some gamers' eyes see more frames per second. This is from Levi Winslow at Kotaku. Ever wondered how pro gamers get so, well, pro? Sure, it's the hours of grinding and practicing, mastering a game's systems and applying them in, a competitive, in competitive situations. And yeah, it's the hours of learning and studying, returning to the game's roots and watching the players that came before. But also, it may just be better eyeballs. According to a new research out of Dublin, pro gamers see more images than others. As spotted by The Guardian, Ireland's Trinity College Dublin recently published a, play, a, a paper in the peer-reviewed open access journal Plos, uh, Plos One. The research investigated a human characteristic called temporal resolution, which measures our, our, our eye's ability to discern between different visual signals and influences our reaction speed to changes in our environment. As the paper found, some people, when presented with a light that was flashing about 30 to 35 times per second, saw it as constantly lit. In other words, they could not perceive the flashes, while others could see the light flashing, even when the frequency of flashes was greater than 60 times per second. In the, in the same way that video games can run at 30 frames per second or 60 frames per second, this research suggests some people's eyes can see visual signals at either 30 images per second or 60 images per second. And this impacts athletes and gamers specifically. Um, I think they uh, tested this with like tennis players and the ones that had the, this higher visual resolution uh, were, you know, tip, tended to be, have a better chance at playing tennis or something like that. And, you know, the way that the, the conversation around frames per second happens, Steve, this paper, like, sheds a lot of light on why this com why that conversation is so weird. Sometimes where, like, some people are like, hey, no, I, I don't see the difference. And some people are like, I cannot stand looking at anything that is under 60 frames per second. Um, if a 60 frame, if a light bulb was flashing at 60 uh, times per second and you saw that as flashing, that would be very annoying. Uh, and I bet those people are especially sensitive. Does this uh, sound right to you? Are you someone that uh, to, that um, craves a higher frame rate or does it matter to you? I like higher frame rates for sure. And I could see where you know, this is just an adaptation of human physiology. Um, but there, there is, a, there is, a, speaking as a profoundly disabled guy, I'm telling you, it's wild how your body sort of starts to make up for, uh, yeah. you know, what, what you're lacking in one area. It, it strengthens the other. It, it, it sounds like an old wives tale, but I can tell you, um, one of my skills that came in handy for gaming was I've been in a power wheelchair since I was eight years old. So my brain has learned to see the world in geometry so when my arms were good enough that i could drive with a precision fast and furious driver i could walk into a room that i've never seen before that had a couch and a, an end table and some chairs i could literally look at the room spin around and go backwards park into a spot and not hit a thing because my brain knew how to do that so when i translated that to um things like sony's um games where you did top down 2d shooting you had to bounce bullets off of walls in order to hit people like pull shots like the geometry in my brain just kicked right in because i had already been used to that kind of physics and i think that's probably where these kind of things go as well if you're a natural born athlete or whatnot it's probably not hard for your brain to see in that kind of uh, fast motion vision yeah and i think i think some speaking of like 
something that you kind of, if you're in a, an environment where these things matter, if you are someone who's like playing tennis from a young age and you do need to understand where the ball is going to uh, go next, uh, being able to, uh, you know, looking at that over and over again, you're probably going to become more accustomed to looking for tiny differences. And that probably increases your ability to see, you know, frames per second or images per second, however they want to describe it. I bet it's something that if you look for it, if it's something that matters to you, if it, it's something that matters to your hobby, uh, it, you become more sensitive to it. So, uh, I, and I'm sure at the same time, there's also some natural born elements there for, for sure. Um, for me these days, Steve, 45 frames per second is good. Uh, I'm playing a lot on the Steam Deck. If I can get 45 frames per second, I uh, it looks pretty smooth to me. Uh, and I'm very happy that that's the case because I don't need to be uh, pushing m many more uh, polygons per second than, than what we already have. So I'm glad my Steam Deck works in most cases because of that. Uh, but 30 frames per second is still pretty painful to me. I, I don't like it too much these days. It yeah. uh, kind of bums me out when a game runs at 30 frames per second. 30 is kind of... Yeah, I mean, I imagine 30, we used to be like, oh my God, this is amazing. You know, now we kind of look at it as it's trash. And it's 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 funny how the way your expectations move as the years go on. But I can, I mean, I have friends who, you know, um, are wanting uh, monitors that, you know, have uh, you know up to a thousand frames per second. And I'm <laughs> like, you realize your brain can't actually comprehend that, right? Like, it's, they're literally just making numbers at this point. Yeah, and it's um there is the, for the very top esports athletes having like a 360 hertz uh, a display that, that it does make a difference for them, but just them, <laughs> the, like oh, the only people on earth that matters for are like the top Counter Strike and Valorant players, and having like just that tiny bit of extra information of how a character is moving through a space, like that little crack in the wall. Yeah, so you could see like that that like sliver of them as opposed to like oh now the, already half of them has passed before they showed up in that sliver. Yeah, that can make a difference, uh, but it's really just you're not going to see the difference. Absolutely not. Um, all right, uh, moving on once again here. This is the last week your 3DS and Wii U games will work online. This is from George Yang at Gamespot on mm. April 8th at 4 p.m. Pacific time, 7 p.m. Eastern. Online play and communication functionality for Nintendo 3DS and Wii U will shut down. These online services include co-op, leaderboard rankings, and data distribution. Back in October 2023, Nintendo announced that it would be shutting down in early April, and now we have a definitive date. These are There are a few ex exceptions, such as Pokemon Bank and Poke Transporter, which will stay online for the foreseeable future, but Nintendo clarified that they still may end at some point as well. Um, there's a bunch of other features that like spot pass use, uses online communication. So it will not be available after shutdown. However, street pass uses a local communication, meaning that it'll still function. Thank God. Um, this, uh, this is a bummer. I, I, uh, had a lot of fun playing some 3ds games specifically online. Uh, Mario Kart seven was really a, a good time. I played a ton of that. Um, Super Mario Maker is an especially uh, important game to me. I, I love that game uh, and trading levels with people. And actually, but mostly I have been like, you know, one rival trading levels back and forth with me and I would play them. Uh, that that was really special. I'm like, I got to go download those and make sure I can keep them and preserve them on my local. But I'm like, I'm like playing Super Mario Maker, Steve, and I'm like looking at the way it works. And I'm like, even if I save these levels locally, a lot of times it feels like it's trying to communicate and talk to online before I can even get to that menu. I hope that that functions uh, once the once the servers are down and the game it just isn't fully broken that would be devastating so um yeah it's it's a end of an era uh, obviously this was always going to come to an end uh but it do, it still bums me out steve how do you feel about it were you a big street passer did you did you get oh, yeah. into all that oh yeah. definitely a huge street passer yes and it's, it sounds like yeah. street pass will still work i guess we'll see i don't know I, I knew people who would just fervently be running around packs trying to street pass as many humans as they possibly could. It, it, I remember them having a lot of fun with it, too. Um, yep. 3DS was not a particularly accessible console for me, so I missed out on a lot of that kind of fun. Um, but from my perspective, it was always interesting that it seemed like the 3DS's main hook was being able to do things with each other. So, you know, closing down the online services, yeah, they're definitely trying to move people on for sure. Yeah, I, I and it's um, I'm sure that there's costs involved and uh, costs with like you know customer support. Like if someone like has an issue and you're like, why are we still supporting this thing? Or or you have to have a huge infrastructure behind the scenes and no one maybe no one is using that customer service stuff. So I, I get why these things uh, deprecate over time. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a bummer for me. And I uh, 
have been playing Dan the Reichert's levels that he made in Super Mario Maker, which are just true nightmares, uh, but people are really enjoying those streams. And uh, I do have them all downloaded locally. At least I think I do. I'm gonna double check today, everybody. Um, but I, I hope that they still work because it would be a real shame if those levels were lost. And I, I know we could like recreate them in Super Mario Maker 2, uh, but we shouldn't have to do that. Uh, that's that stinks. We should just be able to continue to have it. And, Interesting. Why yeah, didn't they come up with a with a port that would wouldn't actually bring them up to the next generation? It's Nintendo, right? That's the answer. Is it? This is just how Nintendo operates. They don't like, oh, you know, just no, just make make new levels or, or go back to the old one, and then well, actually, we're shutting down the old one. So, uh, too bad. It's Nintendo, and they don't care that much about that sort of continuity. Uh, it's uh, that is a negative of that company, and you would think. You know, it can't be too hard to create a tool there. You just press a button, and now it works in Super Mario Maker 2. And I bet it wouldn't be that hard, but Nintendo just does not put efforts into those kinds of quality of life uh, online features. So it's a bummer. Um, as long as I can keep playing those levels, though, I will keep playing them on Giant Bomb, everybody. So uh, keep looking forward to Mario Maker Morning Mess when available. Uh, all right, uh, new, a new Mario RPG survey acknowledges existence of the Mario and Luigi series. This is from Liam Doolin at Nintendo Life. Nintendo is reportedly sending out a survey that has fans of certain Mario franchises excited about what could be on the way. As highlighted by Mario fans across multiple subreddits and social media, a new survey not only acknowledges the Paper Mario and Super Mario RPG titles, but also the handheld series Mario and Luigi. Of course, just a handful of these questions have uh, already led to speculation that Mario and Luigi games could be making a return. There are also many questions asking about the gameplay mechanics across each of these series with uh, with mention of the battle systems, features, and even characters. Um, so this is interesting because Mario and Luigi is from a team called Alpha Dream. That studio shut down because they put out a couple of Mario and Luigi remasters and remakes at the end of the 3DS when the Switch was out and everyone in the world stopped buying 3DS games. So those games did very poorly and the studio had to shut down, which to me was always like, Nintendo, you kind of did this team dirty. I know you don't mm -hmm. own them, they're a partner. Help them out and keep them going so you can keep making these games. But again, no, Nintendo, fucking weird a lot of times. Um, and so that studio went away and I think the expectation is Mario and Luigi goes away with them. So now people see Mario and Luigi in the survey and they're getting their hopes up. I think, Steve, when I looked at the survey, the sense I got is that Nintendo is looking for ideas that people liked from all of the Mario RPGs to inform how they make RPGs going forward. For example, there were a couple of questions about, hey, do you like when um, like the, these RPGs have new characters like Gino and Mallow from Super Mario RPG, or do you only like it when they have familiar Mario characters like Peach and Bowser? And there was options for like, I like new characters, I like the familiar characters, or I like both equally. And then another question was, do you like it when these characters that are familiar behave and look in a way that is consistent with how you expect them to behave in other games, or is it okay if they act in unique and kind of kooky ways? And these are definitely questions that have come up with the Mario RPG franchise a, a series before, where it was like, hey, um, it seems like Miyamoto doesn't like it when like the like a Koopa was wearing a hoodie or whatever. Uh, and now it feels like maybe they're softening on that, especially depending on like how these survey questions pan out. I, I don't, I'm not getting my hopes up for a new Mario and Luigi game, Steve. I'm a huge Mario and yeah. Luigi fan. I'm not getting my hopes up from that. I don't think that a survey is, is a signaling that that's what happening, what is happening. I don't know, what do you think? No, I don't think that the survey is indicative of a, a particular title coming out. I think Nintendo is probably trying to do their due diligence. I think that it, they are worried that, you know, this is a new market, uh, next generation coming up, taking over. You know, what what's going to happen to Mario as we change into the old guard like us are now in retirement homes playing our Super Mario, you That's know? Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so will, will, the, will the, you know, the next generation adapt to it and... Um, Things they do like flashier things. They do like the small microtransactions. You know, could we see a day where you know you can buy a little hoodie for your Koopa on your Nintendo store? Maybe. So yeah. you know, I could I could see where uh, cosmetics are big, and I think Nintendo recognizes it. Yeah, and I think um, I I think you're right that they're like always looking into that younger audience. Nintendo is the one uh, major video game, video game company that has always been able to sort of renew itself with new generations of of players where uh, Sony and Microsoft seeming like, hey, sometimes they catch on, sometimes they don't. So Nintendo being like, hey, how do you feel? And then being like, oh, and we, we had you sign in for the survey, so we know your demographics. And if you're an old head, we know you're gonna buy our shit no matter what. 
uh it, but if you're a kid well, that's actually what we care about and do you care if it's like a, a new character or do you uh, like do you want only bowser and princess peach and luigi and mario in these games and if they say yes i could see that really informing how nintendo goes about it absolutely uh all right uh let's see here last story here kind of a, a quick thing coming to xbox game pass is lego 2k drive ea sports pga tour harold halibut and more uh, this is for Megan Spurt at Xbox Wire. Uh, my favorite part about coming soon to Game Pass is that it quickly turns into available today, and that includes a super hot Mind Control Delete, which is coming to cloud, console, and PC on Game Pass. Um, there's a bunch of games returning to Game Pass, including Super Hot Mind Control Delete uh, and, and some others. Um, I guess that's what that, that's why it's available today. And then the coming soon includes L Lego 2K Drive, Little Gator Game, EA Sports PGA Tour, Kona botany manor shadow of the tomb raider definitive edition and harold halibut um tell you what steve that harold halibut game looks very interesting to me uh that's um i'm glad that that's on game pass because it's one where i'm like i think it looks interesting but I, I i maybe would wait for other people to tell me it's a must play before i would dive into it being on game pass I, maybe i'll just check it out and, and play it myself um but harold halibut is that um stop motion looking video game where uh, it, it just a actually looks like a stop motion movie, but it's, it's an interactive game. And I, I'm not sure how much like you control the action. Maybe a lot of it is just like, hey, move a character over there and it's like preset motions. But either way, it looks fantastic. So I'm glad that's gonna get a chance to really catch on with a lot of people. And then I always like a good golf game. So EA Sports PGA Tour showing up in here is a, a good sign uh, that a lot more people will end up playing that. Uh, but yeah, how are you feeling about Game Pass these days, Steve? I mean, like we were talking about earlier, you know, it's a great way to try out things before you buy. It's a great way to see the different games out there. I mean, you know me, I'm a huge proponent of de demos because, you know, if you are a disabled person, you may not be able to play a game and you'll know within the first three minutes. And that really sucks when you just spent 70 bucks for a game and then you can't use it. Yep. Yep. So, you know, I'm a big fan of demos and I think Game Pass does that really right. I don't know the financials of it, but I do know we keep seeing some mega titles coming to Game Pass, so it must not be quite the worst way to make a buck as a studio. Yeah, and, and uh, you see a lot of repeat uh, customers, right? You see Sega show up a lot of times with their games, and Capcom has had a couple of games uh, go in there. Um, I think it was, it was Exo Primal in Game Pass. I think it was, and then yeah. um, and now they're you know they're back at it with that Path of the Goddess game, uh, which is a single player adventure game that has like a triple A budget. And Capcom's like, yeah, we will put this new brand new video game into Game Pass day one. Uh, to me, that continues to feel like a really big deal. Like a big publisher, yeah. that, a successful publisher like Capcom that knows how to market a game, that knows it can build an audience with almost anything. Is like, no, we have Game Pass is maybe the right way to, for, for us to do that. It's a sign that I think something is working there. And at the same time, I don't know. I'm not sure about Game Pass's long-term long growth. It seems like it's reached all the gamers it can reach. So I, I hope Microsoft's happy with it because I continue to be pretty happy with Game Pass myself. Yeah, I mean, it's the it's the Sega channel on steroids, right? It's, it's <laughs> That's <awesome>. right. <laughs> That's right. Did you ever use Sega channel? I never had a friend that oh, had yeah. it, so I, I never got the chance to use oh. it. I, I, yeah, I loved it because I was... Uh... Uh, hounding my mom when I was a kid to, to go to Blockbuster so often. She's like, if I just get you the Sega channel, will you stop? And I'm like, yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I take my 30 games a month. Oh, that's incredible. Uh, all right. So let's get to the poll question from, I believe this is from Friday because we did the April Fool's episode on Monday where I played Mario Maker instead. Are you going to try the Stellar Blade demo? 39% said yes. 61% said no. Uh, I tried the Stellar Blade demo. I thought that game was pretty fun, Steve. Uh, it is very, it's very much informed by a lot of other games, and that's very obvious. It's got a lot of Nier Automata, a lot of Bayonetta, a lot of Sekiro, a lot of Devil May Cry. Um, and I was uh, t talking to uh, uh, Sean, who, who uh, works with us here at Giant Bomb, and he was like, yeah, I think people can kind of see what they, what, what they want to see in this game in terms of the gameplay mechanics, and I definitely think that's true. I was definitely seeing a lot of Sekiro. He was seeing a lot of Devil May Cry. Um, but yeah, I, I'm also like not, to, I'm like a little surprised. It's like, ah, you know, the, the demo's out there. It's like a big PlayStation exclusive. Uh, you know, is, are people going to try it? Like only 39% saying yes. I wonder if this is a game that's going to need more word of mouth uh, uh, going ahead. Is this something that you're interested in? I mean, I didn't even heard about, so uh, literally, literally hearing about it now. I mean, that's, again, we were talking about marketing and not finding out about games, you know, uh, and I didn't have a clue and I work in the industry, so. 
Yeah, so Stellar Blade is the one where if you see people arguing online about the way uh, women look in video games, this is this is the one. <laughs> this is the one mm, that is getting gotcha. people mad. And a, a lot of women are like, yeah, you, we, we want to talk about this. And a lot of weird dudes are getting very mad that anyone uh, suggests that it's worth talking about, uh, which is just frustrating. So, yeah, that's where we're at with all that. Uh, all right, we have another poll question we're going to get to in a second. Before we do that, Steve, why don't you tell people where they can find you on the internet, what you have going on, and let's remind them once more ab about the uh, Able Gamers Gala. Yeah, uh, people can find me, Stephen Spawn, spelled just like it is below the screen, S P O H N. Uh, just about anywhere. Uh, our our sadly defunct Twitter being the main place I like to hang, but uh, you know, it's it's a muskrat village now. So uh, take it as you will. That's correct. Um, <laughs> uh but um the real reason that i'm here today and jeff is putting up with my shenanigans is because of the able gamers gala uh the gala is a really cool virtual event if you think stardew valley meets zoom where you're gonna get to go in and play in this 2d environment where a bunch of your influencer friends like you know uh little simsy and pirate software and jeff grubb are gonna be hanging out so if you want to go hopefully bump into some of your favorites uh buy a ticket online ablegamers.org slash gala and uh come check out all the festivities we have uh bartenders live on scene character artists it's gonna be a lot of fun it's a big party and it all supports gamers with disabilities all proceeds going to support the missions of able gamers and let us keep the lights on fantastic uh again check that out everybody ablegamers.org slash gala 20 2024 if you want to just go there but yeah just go to ablegamers.org you'll be able to find it everybody uh all right uh let's see here the new poll question is uh, which uh, actually did i come up with a poll question for today uh you know what? Here, here's here's what i'm uh, interested in now did you play if you, or if you played the uh, uh, Stellar Blade demo, did you like it or not? Yes or no? And then, of course, I'll be an option there. I, I, no, I really didn't play it. So we'll get that up for you. Uh, we'll talk about that on the show tomorrow uh, on here on Giant Bomb. Speaking of Giant Bomb, what do we have going on? I think today we are going to play some more Tekken. I'm going to get through the story mode of Tekken, I believe, or at least get m much deeper into it, but we'll likely be able to see the end. And then there is no Blight Club today. Dan and Jan are on their way to WrestleMania. So instead, we're going to do D-Light Club, which is our series where uh, we pick a game that we think another, one of our coworkers likes, and we make them play that. Mike is going to make me play Gamera for PlayStation 1. He thinks I'm going to like that game a lot. I did get it ready, and I did take a peek at it, and it started immediately with an incredible FMV in full English. Uh, and I am very excited about it, everybody. So check that out. That'll be at like 2.30ish, 3 p.m. today. Uh, Tekken will happen when I'm able to get it going. Uh, again, Jan's out. We're figuring things out on the fly. Um, and then uh, tomorrow, expect uh, uh, the voicemail dump truck. Friday, we'll have UPF and BCR. Look out for all of that. Uh, in the meantime, though, Steve, Spawn, thank you so much for spending today talking with me about video games, man. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me here. I appreciate you. Big fan of yours, as always. And I look forward to seeing you Saturday at 4 p.m. Sounds good. Likewise, Steve, uh, I'll be there. Uh, everyone else, you should be there as well. Uh, check out ablegamers.org. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you. You're the best audience in gaming. Until next time, have a good one. Take care of yourself. And goodbye.